1 Thessalonians.
the way that he, he talks about it and laboring night and day, and he probably sacrificed some sleep to accomplish it as well. So he's telling me, he's saying, we, we, we put in the work here. And, and he's not talking about it to uh, prop up himself. He, he, you know, he, he's pointing the reference, and he, he's, he's talking about it. He wants them to be able to serve the Lord. And that's why he, he put the work into it. And so now as we, we look at the second half of this chapter, what we're going to see is the, uh, the response of the Thessalonian church, or those in Thessalonica, that uh, the way that they responded to the message and the example that Paul and those of his group set for them. Uh, as well, the, the last few verses deal you know, as well as Paul's desire to uh, come back to them and, and to work with them some more. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll get started with this. Lord, I am just so I'm thankful to be here. I just is so many things that can happen that can uh, prevent this opportunity, so many things that you've done in our past to make this possible, Lord. I just ask that uh, you would open our hearts to your word, help us to uh, just remain focused on it, to not be distracted, to not allow other things that are going on in our lives to uh, be at the forefront now, but to just place that all on the back burner and to just right now be focused on your word, be focused on the application that it has for us. And I said you would give me wisdom and words to speak that ultimately everything would be for your honor, glory, and your will. Jesus' name, amen. We look, starting in verse 13 of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye had heard of us, ye received it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Paul again, he's talking about the Thessalonians, and he says, that for this cause, we, we thank God without ceasing. The, the response that they had to the work of the Lord within them, the response that they had to His work, or to His word, it, it, it gives them cause to rejoice. To be thankful as we, back in, in chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And, and we discuss this, that uh, this is the same uh, way that you refer to the Philippian church. And how uh, you know strong they were in the Lord and how much they were a blessing to Paul in his ministry. And he, he's talking about them again the same way. And, you know, I want us to notice here that what Paul's joy is, what Paul is excited about, is them responding to the Word. That's his motivation for everything he does, is people responding to the Word of God. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to have the fame and the glory. He doesn't want to have uh, riches or, or money for all this. He wants people to have the gospel in their heart. He says, well, I'm thankful for you guys for him. And I do it without ceasing. I, I do it all the time. We do it all the time. It's you guys receiving the word. Because I want us to notice here the way he talks about them receiving the word. He says, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in, as you receive the word of God, which you heard 
of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And I says, and, and the way that you guys heard this, the way that you respond to this, I, I'm so excited because you didn't respond to it as some profound word that a man has given you, that a man has thought of. You responded to it as the word of God, which is what it was, what it is. You know, something that a lot of people fall into the trap of is that they listen to things, and you know, it happens even in our churches. People that they hear the Word of God being taught, but they listen to it, they understand it as the Word of man. And you're asking, well, what do you mean? Well, an example of somebody that hears the Word of God as the words of man, not as the Word of God, as somebody that when a pastor makes a mistake or when a pastor leaves, they leave. Another thing that exemplifies it is a person that is affected by what other people do and it dictates what they're doing as a Christian. You know, there's, and, and I'm not going, I don't want to minimize the importance of us working to not make mistakes. We're not, I'm not making excuses for people making mistakes and that it should be okay for you to do whatever. That's not right. But the thing is, is that we need to not be trusting in people. Our faith and the things that we do, they need to not be based on a person. There, there, there's people that have completely rejected the faith because of what other people did. And you know, whenever a church is a very bad representation of Christ and isn't following the Lord, even though that is a horrible thing, what other people are doing shouldn't dictate your relationship with the Lord. Because you're not following the Word of man, you're following the Word of God. And His Word is the same regardless of what other people are doing. We need to not be trusting people. We need to be trusting God. We need to not be hanging on to the word of those that are very wise because of a person, but because of the message of the Lord that they are providing. What makes a, a good teacher or a a, a good preacher, a, a good pastor for you in your life is how well you listen to the Word of God. Now there's an importance for the teacher and preachers and pastors to study and to be prepared in presenting God's Word. But it needs to be received as God's Word. Not man's Word. Because if your faith is based on a person or a group of people those people are going to fail you. Those people are going to come up short. And we notice as well here, we also notice at the end of verse 13, he says, after he talks about it being the Word of God, he says, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I want us to know this other thing here. They didn't just agree that it was the Word of God. What do you, you, may be thinking, what do you mean by that? They didn't just say, oh, that's God's Word, and that was it. What we see is that God's Word effectually worked within them. Within those that had believed. It means they heard the word of God. They believed and God's word worked within them. It changed them. What it means effectually worked, it's just, it basically it means it's, it's efficient in their lives. It's efficiently working within their lives. 
Which means here that what's happened is that they've taken it and they, they allow it to work and, and to change them. You know, it's not enough just to sit here and think, yeah, I agree with that, or yeah, that's good, yeah, that's right, and then not allow it to do anything in our lives. What Paul's excited about here for them is not that they were there listening to it, but that they received it as the Word of God and responded to it as the Word of God and let it work in their lives and change them. What keeps God's Word from being efficient in our lives is us listening to it and allowing it to work. says, y'all, y'all got that. You understood that it wasn't what I was teaching. It wasn't me. It was God's Word. And you realize that it wasn't something just for you to know, but something that you were to take action on. Notice here that they continue with us in spite of their circumstances. Verse 14, it says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. And he says, you know, and you guys... The same thing is taking place with you guys, what's happened in Jerusalem, in Judea. And what he's talking about there is the persecution that takes place. Well, all the Jews that accepted the gospel, they're persecuted by their fellow countrymen. They were deemed to be heretics. They were, they were uh, when you look in Acts, you say that they're basically run out. They're, they're caused to scatter abroad because of the persecution. And he tells them, he says, the same thing's happened with you guys. You're working so hard and sharing the gospel, you're doing all these things and, and following Christ and it's changing you that even those that live in the same place as you, your, your other co fellow countrymen, they're treating you the same way that the Jews treat you. Christian or Jew, Jewish converts. Full on persecution. And this just shows the commitment to it. Their desire and, and the work that has taken place has become so much. And they're doing it in spite of all this persecution, all this outside pushing. But Paul was very much so run out of town when he was in Thessalonica. Describes the way they were. Verse 15 it says, Who killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us, and they have pleased not God and are contrary to all men. Because it's a very sad description of a nation that is supposed to be God's people. Because he's describing deep their persecution runs in Jerusalem. That there would, you know, as we know, the Jews are the ones that crucified Christ. His very own people that he had set aside to follow him, to love him, they are the ones that crucified him. And you see as well, it speaks in the condition of them and their, their hearts. They talks about them killing their own prophets, even. Their own people within their nation that were brought up by the Lord to, to, to share God's words with them and to teach them. They, they rejected this. They, they rejected uh, John the Baptist. Oh, while it was uh, a Herod that ultimately took his life, he, the Jews wanted it. And 
didn't like the message he was preaching. Their desire is not to please God. It's not to be uh, accepted by Him. And so for that, they're, they're contrary to all men. They're against everyone. They're working us all. And I think this is very sad because their love for their sin has grown so much that a nation that was built to spread the Lord, the Lord that was meant to be the, the example to all of the world in following the Lord, they're contrary to everybody else. They hate everybody else. I mean, you just need an example. Just look at the, you can see the way uh, in Scripture and, and through history, you can see their, their prejudice against everybody else that wasn't a Jew. Even people that were part Jew, they hated. We see the condition as well in this, the verse 16 says, forbidding us to speak the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. I mean, he says they, their, their sin was so great within them. Their hate, or their, their, their love for that sin, and consequentially their, their hate for the Lord caused them to not even want it spread to anybody else. They rejected the gospel and they didn't even they didn't want other people to have the gospel either. They definitely didn't want the Gentiles having it. Uh, their, their desire, their focus was just looking at for ways to sin. And you know uh, people that are, are wanting to stand or wanting to sin are going to stand against anybody else that is going against sin. Anybody else is working against it because it convicts them. You know, there's nothing, uh, in, oftentimes uh, there would be times in being uh, asked to do something by my parents growing up and it was one of those things, that whenever it was commanded us to do something, there was no option. It was just go do it. But there were things in our lives that we were given the, the opportunity to do something. And we turned it down and then somebody else did it and ended up getting something that was really great. And it made you feel really crummy for not being the one to do it. get mad and get jealous and you try and condemn the other one for doing it. And this is what the Jews have done. They, they, they're immersed in their sin and, and their heart is so full of jealousy and hatred that you know, even they rejected it, they still don't want anybody else to have it. But the persecution is not because of the people, it's because of their rejection of God, of the Lord. I want us to notice what he says about them. Their, their desire is to, to fill up their sins, to just be consumed in their sins. But he says, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. This is something that needs to be reminded of, that <laughs> they're not going to get away with it. They're going to pay for it. The wrath of the Lord will come. You know, there are people that work very hard to try and suppress the gospel. Because within themselves, they think by suppressing the gospel, that it, it, you know, it, it feeds them and it makes them feel better about things. Like they're, they're going to get away with it if everybody rejects it. Makes them feel better. But here's the thing. They'll still have to answer for it. The punishment is still going to come. I want to 
us to see in verses 17 through 20 we have the uh, Paul speaking about his absence from them. He says in verse 17, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time of presence, I at heart endeavor the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. You know, <clears throat> when we look at Acts, it uh, it tells us that for three Sabbath days they were uh, preaching, that Paul was preaching in a synagogue. And it doesn't completely outright say it, but it, when just looking at that and what's provided, it seems to indicate that he was only there for three weeks. A very short amount of time. And regardless of this, we, we see that you know Paul, he had to leave. Him and his party, they, and when we look at Acts, we see that they're, they're kicked out of the town. There was no option for them but to leave. And, you know, something that I am sure is happening here is that the reason Paul is writing to them, he's, he's expressing to them, he's saying, you know, I, I haven't abandoned you guys. I didn't just jump ship on you. Even though I'm not there in person, I am there in heart. I am still caring for you. I still want to help you guys. I, I, I haven't abandoned you. Now we see that one of the things that the, the Thessalonians were dealing with is, is they, they were being uh, taught or they, they had gotten an the idea that the, the resurrection had always already happened. That they weren't going, they, basically they, they missed the return of Christ. And I, I'm sure whoever was there teaching me, one of the things that they did, because we see it taking place time and time again, and we see that Paul is talking about the message that he preaches to them as well, which seems to indicate his people were undermining Paul. They were trying to say, ah, oh, he, he just left you. Left you then for your own. He was just after himself. And Paul says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still caring for you guys. And it's just a short time that I'm gone. And I, I want us to notice here, verse 18, he says, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. We've been looking at this in Thessalonians, and we see that the work that was taking place there, the growth that was taking place, it, it was obvious that the Lord's was growing within them. The Lord's work was being done. We, they had really good things going on. They were all on the right path. And Paul says, you know, I, I wanted to come back and ask you guys, but Satan has put a roadblock in our path to keep us from being able to come. And this is something that we always need to be remembering is that when we get started and, and, and the work is being done and, and people, we're getting excited for the Lord or even in your own personal life, you're, you're working and, and you're doing things, Satan's going to put a roadblock up. He's going to do something to try and stop it, to discourage it, to cause problems. Because he, he doesn't want it to keep going. He doesn't want it to keep happening. He wants to put it out. And I think it's important for us to remember this, to be aware of it. Because I think far too often, Christians are caught off guard by the defenses of Satan, or the attacks of Satan. They're taken off guard by it. And because of it, the damage that is done is much greater than it would have been if people were ready and saw it and responded to it as an attack of Satan. Every time God's people start working, He's got something to do. The work to stop. And this is what's happened here. Paul says, you know, I, I, I try to come to you. I wanted to come sooner. I want to come, but I, I just can't. And he wants to remind them of something here in verse 19. He says, for what is our hope or joy? Or crown of rejoicing. Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? 
Ghost coming. Paul says, though, he says, you know, even though I can't come, even though we can't come, that's not what should be giving you guys your hope and your joy and, and your rejoicing. I'm not what you guys are supposed to be excited in. What you should be excited in, what you can be excited in, is Christ. And that you're not left alone. Oh, he's again, and, and this is kind of his his purpose in, in pointing out to them that in the beginning, their their focus, their their everything they were doing, it was about Christ. And the work of Christ. And these are the things they're doing. And he's trying to remind them. He says, you know, even though I'm not here, you still have Christ. You still have the promises of Him. You still have what's coming. This hasn't been taken away from you. You haven't missed this. It's still there. Rejoice in it. Be excited in it. Allow it. To make sure to focus on it as being your hope, as being your joy, as being what you rejoice in. And this, I want us to remember this again because as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we were talking about that sometimes people place too much faith in the people. And when the people make mistakes, it causes their faith to fall apart. A lot of times we allow the people around us to dictate our hope and our joy and our rejoicing. And this is something, as a part of the Lord's body and as our, our fam, being in the family of God, we are to encourage each other and help each other. And it, we should be trying to encourage each other in Christ. But our ultimate source of hope, joy, and all of this needs to be focused on Christ. other people. Because people fail. Paul is telling me, saying, you don't need me to follow Christ. I want to come. I want to help you guys. But you don't have to have me for this. You can do it on your own. You can still have all of this. Because you've already done it. I've seen it. Everything that I do, everything about me, Paul says, is, it's all about Christ. It's all Christ. So just skip me and go to Christ. Paul even tells him, he says, for ye are our glory and joy. He says, instead of you guys needing us, instead of us being what you guys think you need, in all actuality, you guys, we're, we're excited about you guys. And he, he's not excited about them as individuals, he's excited because of what they're doing and saying, you know, you think you need me, to do all this, but in all actuality, through the work of Christ within you, through what's going on, you are a source of glory, rejoicing in the Lord. So you can do it. Far too often we think we need somebody else to accomplish something. You need somebody else and no. There's nothing wrong with needing help or allowing help. I believe the whole purpose of the church is to work as a body together. But still on an individual level, you can rejoice in the Lord. You can accomplish much. Christ. And ultimately, what makes us as a body work is Christ again. 
as us encouraging and helping each other in Christ, towards Christ. Come each other. It's not my strength. It's not Brother Homer's strength. It's not Brother Mike's strength, Brother Jim's strength. It's the Lord's strength. And each and every single one of us have access to the exact same 